Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it is for you. Thank you for joining me for Garden Smorgasbord. Let's dive in and look at what we're going to cover today. It's going to be a bunch of different things, hence the word smorgasbord. So hopefully we'll have some fun with this one. What are we going to explore? We're going to look at easy natives. Uh, we'll also discuss a little bit what easy means, plants for shade, uh, overlooked native plants that maybe you haven't considered using or maybe you didn't think would work in your landscape. landscape and I'll, I'll try and push those on you a little bit. Uh, we'll look at some native plants that could show some good uh, bunny and deer resistance for you. Not always a solid bet, but we can throw some better plants out there than um, just having lots of asters, which they love to eat. We'll look a little bit at fundamentals of natural garden design, a few um, core strategies for that. Uh, we'll also explore dandelion alternatives. This, that's going to be an interesting sort of, uh, oh, it might be a little controversial. Same thing with uh, less honeybee, more native bee talk, but we're going to look at some research and, and look at some real facts about those issues. Are you ready to go? Yeah, we don't need any puns for this talk. Sometimes with classes I do that, but get freebie. All right, let's look at easy native plants. You can see a couple in this example. If you, you can, I bet you can identify some of these plants in here. Well, what does easy mean? I think when we say that we tend, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think when we say easy, we mean these things. Uh, grows well with little input. So we don't really have to fuss with it too much. We don't have to water it too much. For, we, don't think, we don't ever have to think about fertilizing or all that stuff. Um, when we say easy, we also, I think, mean that it lives a long time. So obviously that would mean it's a perennial, um, but it's not just going to be around for a couple of years. Hopefully it's here for five or 10 years. So it's just, it's just really a strong plant that's happy and well adjusted in its environment. We also mean by easy is that it doesn't take over because one of the hardest things in the garden is to have a plant that you love and are excited about and then in a couple years that bed is just that plant. You've got 20 square feet of just obedient plant or something. Um, if you're going to plant something like obedient plant in your garden, you want to make sure you have lots of other similarly aggressive species around it so they can du duke it out and, and keep each other in check. And by easy we also mean it doesn't get too big. Um, that's a very nuanced conversation we'll get into a little bit in a second. Um, but you don't want to plant something where the plant tag says it gets two feet tall and you know there's a perfect spot for it and then next year the thing is four or five feet tall. That can certainly happen when the plant is put into soil that's too rich or it doesn't have enough uh, plant competition or maybe it gets to, you know, a little bit more moisture than it really needs. You know, it's the big one. What we say, we mean easy, we mean site adaptable. So it's more forgiving. That means you can plant something in slightly dry soil or slightly moist soil, or maybe it just gets morning sun or maybe it just gets afternoon sun. I don't know, but it works in a lot of different site conditions. So it's a very pliable, happy-go-lucky plant. Now those are, those are far and few between. That's why you really got to know your plant and, and know the site you're putting that plant into and, and make, the, make a good match. All right, what does it really mean when we say uh, easy native plants? That means plants match the site conditions, plants matched to one another. Now that one another, I was just talking about an obedient plant. That means you don't just, you don't want to have an aggressive plant in a bed surrounded by well-behaved, you know, uh, clump, clumping plants because guess who's going to win that battle? Plants with more compact form and or moderate growth rates. That's going to mean easy. I think about compact form, we think here. You know, something I'm going to talk about nodding onion allium cernuum a lot today in several sections, but that's that's certainly one. I would even think uh, butterfly weed, orange butterfly milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa, relatively compact, relatively well behaved. Even even um, species that are, are growing out of corms underground, like like um, the atris, are going to be fairly well behaved in general. So moderate growth rates um, and, and a more compact form. Even something like aromatic aster, Symphil trichum oblongifolium, um, while it is going to slowly spread and eventually get three feet wide or two feet tall or something, it's, it's still um, very shrub-like, so very manageable and easy to live with. So here's an example of easy native plants um, and, and some of the issues we run into. 
So something like purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, grown in a rich loamy soil and in a traditional mulch garden bed. Now traditional mulch garden bed is you have a Echinacea and then you're religiously following the plant tag and you're spacing it like 18 inches away or something like that or even 12. Um, then you have a bunch of mulch between the plants and then you get your another plant 12 inches away and then mulch. Um, that's that's our traditional garden bed where it's just one layer of plants so the competition is very minimal. So in this situation, if that soil is rich and loamy, you're going to have a shorter lifespan on that purple coneflower. It's, it's going to tend to get to be too tall and flop over because uh, purple coneflower did not, did not evolve to grow in really super rich soil. This is why I'm always advocating against amending soil because um, we, we, we have been taught this idea that soils have to be this, this perfect universal black loamy stuff. It smells very earth, earthy. That's not the case at all. Plants grow in all kinds of conditions. We know this. So we need to match those plants to our site conditions. Um, and Echinacea purpurea is not going to do well there. It likes clay soil. Clay soil has lots of nutrients in it, but it's also going to be um, much more ad adapted to purple coneflower. So yeah, place it in a leader's role and give it more competition. Um, it's going to, you know, more root competition, uh, more foliage competition above ground. Plants, plants, especially in the prairie, meadow um, um, family group of plants, they thrive on that competition. They need it. Uh, so if you want a plant that's going to live longer and quote unquote be easier, think about Echinacea pallida. That's another coneflower, pale purple coneflower. It's going to live um, quite a bit longer than straight up Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower. So plants are obviously going to behave differently in various site conditions and in various plant communities. So, and if you want to learn more about plant communities and this idea of competition and planting for root structure and, and layers and all that stuff, please check out the class, Fundamentals of Garden Layers, if you haven't watched it already. So here's a list of plants that, at least for me and my design experience and here at headquarters, out back and out front, I would classify as easy native plants. Um, obviously for a lot of these plants, I am being careful with the research and making sure they're in the right place and in the right plant communities. But in general, I would say they are fairly robust and, and fairly forgiving. A lot of us sedges are like that too. It's, I think we have this idea that sedges prefer shade, whether it's moist or dry, but that's just not the case. I think about Carex albicans up there, uh, very first on the list, white tinge sedge. Boy, is that thing far more adaptable than ever dreamed it would be. You know, we can take a lot more sun and a lot more drought than, than I ever realized because I would think, well, that's just a shade plant, even if it, even though it does well in dry shade. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So here's a list going down. The ones with the asterisks, um, if they are in more open soil conditions with less plant competition, they might be a little bit more aggressive. Certainly depends on your soil type. And, and again, on that on the, on the plant layers that you have. Pregnathemum virginianum, uh, Virginia mountain mint, is, is going to obviously move around by runners, but it's going to do far less so when you put it into a matrix, uh, something like uh, Butuluda, Curtipendula, Cytos grama, or a little blue stem. Um, Senna hemocarpa is one I think more people should plant, but the seeds only need 10 days of cold, moist um, weather to, to be stratif stratified before they germinate in the spring. And it is kind of germinate on you. You get lots of seedlings if there's not good ground layer plant competition. But that's a really robust plant. You'll see that one listed a lot for moist sites, but it can take a, a sizable amount of drought because it has quite the taproot on it. All right, you taking your picture? Let's move on. So there we go. I was just talking about Carex albicans. I'm going to, I just love pimping this sedge. There's lots of good sedge out there, but that's certainly one. Hucura richardsonia. I talk about this one often across all of my classes, but look at that foliage and, and look, you can see some of the, so this is probably early to mid-May, some, somewhere right around there. And the warm season grasses are just starting to get going around it. They're maybe, you know, four to six inches tall. And then you, you got the uh, hookah that's maybe about 12 inches tall and it's shooting up its um, flower stalks. So what, what I really like about this combination is, is this a fine grasses of the warm season grasses um, complementing these maple-like big lush green leaves that get really bright red fall and winter color. It's a stunning, stunning combination and it's right out there in nature. It's, it's right in the prairie near you. Just got to take it and bring it home. 
Latris Aspera, rough blazing star. I just love the buds on it. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? This, 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 this is just that white cream sculptural. I don't know. It looks like something you should put on a cupcake. <laughs> uh, it likes dry to medium soils and fold apart sun sites. Now, since it's coming out of a corm, which is a bulb like structure, it's going to work great um, in, in a landscape where you have fibrous rooted plants that are that are serving as the matrix or the main ground cover. So think worm season grasses and sedge. Um, they're not gonna be competing at the same levels. Um, the corm is obviously gonna have roots and, and, and things going down on the ground, but for the most part, it's, it's not competing with, with all these hundreds and thousands of roots coming out of the grasses and the sedge. So a nice compliment there below ground and above ground too, because it gets about three to four feet tall. So it's coming above the grasses and just nice sculptural um, organization. There's Senna again. Look at that. The, the cool thing about Senna, now there's also Senna, oh, how do you pronounce the Latin? Senna Maryland, Marylandica or something like that. That's Maryland Senna. They look very similar. Um, one is more Western, one is more Eastern, but they have a huge overlap. Anyway, this is a plant when it's blooming for about a month to midsummer, you can hear it from 20 feet away. There's so many female bumblebee workers on it, buzz pollinating it. It's just incredible. It's so loaded with bumblebees. It's also a host plant for, I can't remember the, what sulfur butterfly species it is, but you will find eggs on there. Lespedeza capitata, definitely underplanted. You see it in prairies and grasslands and meadows all over the United States. Look at that stunning summer. Um, you know, the flowers aren't that showy, uh, but the, the, the foliage certainly is. It's silver green, a little bit fuzzy, and uh, the winter seed heads are almost jet black, and they stay on there the entire, uh, entire winter. So let's look at some plants for shade. I can't tell you how many times people people email me or talk to me on social media and they're just like, yeah, all of your gardens are beautiful, but it's just all prairie plants. And I know those, those prefer sun. Isn't there anything for shade? I don't think there is. I'll just go plant some hosta and a stilby instead. No, please don't plant hosta and a stilby. There's so many uh, options. You notice some overlap on these lists, and that's good. I think that's very beneficial. Okay, so we got a lot of different sedge species. Oh, good. I got Carex abernia on there in this one, too. That's a nice, low, um, soft, fuzzy, trolled all sort of sedge for dry shade. So you will obviously, on these lists, need to research them no matter what. Put in the Latin name on an internet search. Do not put in the common name. You might end up getting another plant if you do that. Use the scientific binomial nomenclature. Um, sites I like to use for reference are Illinois Wildflowers, Prairie Moon Nursery, Missouri Botanical Garden, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. You can definitely get um, a nice baseline there in plant performance, even if you're on the coast, um, but you can certainly find information relevant to your specific eagle region and locality fairly easily, especially when you type in the scientific name of the plant. So a lot of different things here. We got stuff blooming on this list from, from spring through right on into midfall. And I haven't even touched on on this list um, uh, woodland ephemeral plants. So those are those are plants that are just going to uh, put out their foliage and blooms in the spring, and then they tend to go dormant early to uh, early to midsummer. I guess that'd be we do have one on there. If you can figure out which one it is, initials MV, you win a prize. So Carex springallii, this one isn't as low and flowy and undulating as things like Carex albicans or radiata or rosea. It's a little bit more upright, 12 inches tall, but it's still got a weeping nature to it. Perfect for dry to medium soils and shade to part shade. Now I'm just showing you some of these, some plants on the list, just some highlights. Once again, it is very beneficial for you to do, do the research and do the work because that way you learn far more and you're way more empowered and you're way more confident than if somebody just throws things at you. Um, Calico aster can be slightly aggressive if it doesn't have good plant competition or if it has too much sun. It does sell so like the Dickens, um, but I have found the more competition it has and what the way more in control, um, way more controlled it is. The reason I advocate for it, even though it can be um, a little bit of a self-sower, is because the thing is just, it's just totally covered in a variety of bugs and insects in late summer and, and early fall. We're talking just mass amounts of, of 
<laughs> of pollinator diversity. It's absolutely amazing. And you can just put your nose in your hand and then everybody's so focused on getting pollen and nectar, they don't care if you're there. It's a wonder plant. Spring shade, I know everybody's probably, uh, you know, knows Solomon's seal, but I hardly feel like it's planted anymore. It feels like it's a 1960s or 1970s plant, but my gosh, it, it is so robust and so easy to grow, especially in dry clay soils and full shade. I don't know why, why we don't grow it. And queen, um, queen bumblebees in the spring, they're coming out of their nests, um, you know, they're overwintering hidey holes and they're ready to start their new nest for the year. And it's going to be one of the plants they're coming to, to get pollen to uh, start start growing their workers. Dalectrum, however you pronounce it, it's okay that you can't pronounce things there uh, perfectly. Early meadow rue, incredibly underplanted. This is the female form. There is a male which has which is going to be a little bit showier when it's blooming. Um, you get to see the orange pollen on it, but the foliage is absolutely outstanding. Something that will also pair well. Um, with the fine texture of sedges. Hey, it's already time for your first bonus section of the day. That's my Bob Barker impression. I hope you enjoyed it. Common first year weeds. This, this list probably represents 90% of, 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 of the weeds that I have the biggest issues with. I'm trying to establish a new garden from scratch, especially on a site that's been highly disturbed. And that's basically every site because you're always highly di disturbing a site when you put in a garden. Even if you're spray killing the lawn and then planting your seeding straight into it, um, seeds are now gonna germinate through the, through the open cracks. Um, the, the sunlight's reaching down to the soil because the grass is dead. Um, and certainly if you come in and, and pull up the grass with a sod cutter, then you got bare soil and you got weed nirvana. So here's a list of plants. I'm gonna go over four of them that I think are probably the most common that really aren't that big of a deal if you know how to manage them. Some of these plants you just don't have to actively manage. Um, they will go away on their own. Um, you don't have to worry about them, especially if you're planting a dense, thick, multi-layered garden. The, the native plants, the plugs that you put in are just naturally going to outcompete these weeds in the next year or two. That being the case, henbit does cause some issues, but I have found that it really does not react well to competition. Um, so there's one garden I remember. We did we did flower plugs, so we did those in groups and masses and, and drifts, and then we came in and we side o and we we sowed in side oats grama. Now the first year we had henbit everywhere, and especially in the spring of the second year. Um, but once that cytos grama really started going, which only took a year, uh, the henbit has basically disappeared. It's just getting outcompeted. Prickly lettuce. It is unsightly if it gets out of control because, you know, these stalks are four to five, even six feet tall or something. It can get very large, especially on a rich, moist soil. Don't yank that plant out of the ground. I know when we're weeding, we think we got to go in and yank everything out of the ground. But when you do that, you're just increasing soil disturbance and bringing more weed seeds to the surface. Think about that. Those roots are going down six inches or something. And when you yank those out, the soil is being yanked out with it and all kinds of seeds are being yanked out in the soil. Then they have sunlight and more moisture and they germinate and you've got more prickly lettuce. Just cut this thing down to the ground two or three times a year. Let it die uh, when, the, when the freeze is coming in the fall. Don't let these things flower, right? That's the biggest deal. Green foxtail, we have lots of foxtails. There's yellow foxtail, there's green foxtail. Very common annual that, that, that comes in first year gardens. I have managed this in two ways. One is to leave it alone, but you might not wanna do that because each one of those seed heads has hundreds of seeds in there. So it, it's a lot. Now they're gonna, they're gonna have a very hard time germinating once the garden gets very thick and lush and shades the ground because they need sunlight to germinate. Um, if you want to be really active in the first year, you can just clip the seed heads off as, as, they, as they flower and you'll be fine. Black medic may be a little bit trickier. Uh, I, have, I have problems with this in, in lawn areas in some landscapes where the lawn is not being kept up pristinely, which is fantastic, right? In some ways we're like, yay, celebrating that. Um, but black medic really likes sun and likes a lack of competition. Once it starts to have more competition, it really struggles, and it and it can struggle even more if you have if it's in an open area if it's in an open area 
when you keep hacking it back and trimming it down really close to the ground, either by hand or with scissors, if you're that anal, or just mowing it down really, really low. It's still gonna set a lot of seed. So the goal here is just to, basically with most of these weeds, to shade out, shade out the seedlings and shade out the seeds so they never get a chance to germinate. All right, let's look now at a list of overlooked native plants. And you, you might look at this list and say, oh, these aren't overlooked, I know all about these. But in my experience across the spectrum, I think a lot of them are overlooked, unknown, or, or just, you know, well, why, why would I ever use these? Wild quinine. That one comes with a caveat. Number one, we should definitely be planting it more because it's gorgeous. The foliage, um, the, the flower heads are so unique. We'll look at them pretty soon. But I have definitely found that when you're planting it from plug, it establishes a lot better when you do it in spring than in fall. I don't know what the issue is. I haven't researched it. I just know it's a real issue that it doesn't have enough time to establish when you do it in fall or even late summer. So get that in there in April, May, or June, whatever. You know, whatever you are north to south is going to be earlier in the south, later in the north. I talked about round-headed bush clover and prairie elm root. Bottle brush grass is good for shade, so it's a little taller grass. A lot of most of our sedges are short, one to two feet tall. So if you're looking for something taller, here you go. It's not going to be full and lush. It's going to be pretty open though. Tall coreopsis, probably my favorite coreopsis out there. Man, forget those coreopsis that are 12, 18, 24 inches tall. Boo, boring. Let's get this guy out there. It's six to seven feet, maybe even eight feet tall if it has consistent moisture. Very open form, slowly spreading by rhizomes. You, after maybe about three or four years, you have a nice clump of two to three feet wide or something like that. Uh, very wind tolerant, so it's not gonna get blown down and snapped. It's very forgiving. I just love it. Uh, and, and it's blooming in August primarily. So that's definitely a time of the year when I think a lot of gardeners are wishing they had more flowers out in their landscape. Just put it in the back of the border or the center of the border because it's so tall. White weld indigo. We all know about other baptisias, the purple blooming ones, and even the cream and yellow ones. But what about a really nice white one? Very architectural form. It's really open. Um, looks good among, looks very good uh, uh, among a um, uh, uh, matrix of little blue stem. Schizocarium scoparium. Wow, I can't believe I remembered the Latin on that one. Way to go. Hairy beard tongue, we have lots of different beard tongues. We don't just have to be using Husker red penstem on. <laughs> and then we know about purple prairie clover, but there's also white prairie clover, Dahlia candida. Uh, I can't remember if it's the purple prairie one that blooms first or the white prairie clover that blooms first, but one will bloom for a week or two and then the other one will bloom for a week or two. So you get like a month of prairie clovers, which the bees will be very thankful for. Here's some more New Jersey tea, shrub-like, um, small shrub-like uh, herbaceous perennial. Same with lead plant. Those are two plants you do not want to cut back in the spring. You want to leave them woody because they're going to be sprouting from that. There's our cream wild indigo. Maybe you have and maybe you haven't heard of Baptisia bracteata, but check it out. Then we have lots of milkweed, spider milkweed, short green milkweed. Culver's root, underplanted. I think we'll look at a picture of that one in a second. Um, and then our verveins. I definitely think we look at Verbena stricta, hoary vervain on roadsides and think, oh, that's just a weedy flower driving out in the country. But it can be a very useful garden plant and it is very good for pollinators. And then blue sage, a favorite one for me when I walk in a prairie, I don't see it very often, which, which is surprising because it germinates so easily from seed. It's one of those herbaceous perennials you can sow in June and um, it's gonna be fine. It doesn't need any pretreatment. There's your wild quinine, Perthinium integrifolium. Uh, I wanted to give you this picture, this vantage point, because I wanted to show you the cauliflower-like flowers. Oh, I said cauliflower. My wife makes fun of me because I say it in a Southern Hick way. Or Hick's not the right word, just a Southern accent. I was born in Oklahoma, so she always tells me I need to say cauliflower and not cauliflower. But I also say root beer, so there you go. There is your tall coreopsis. Um, the blooms are going to look very similar, similar to other coreopsis, so it's familiar to you. Just, just imagine that these flowers are top six foot tall stems. So very open, very, very unassuming really from a distance. Um, you don't really notice it until you're right on it because, hey, it's taller than you. 
but an adaptable plant. I would consider that an easy native plant. There's our Verona Castrum virginicum. Gave you a close up this, uh, of this one too, because unlike in this picture, generally it is covered in all kinds of pollinators and it will be blooming for several weeks in midsummer. You will want to have at least a medium moisture soil, if not consistent soil moisture. It will do the, the best in that. And I think even in clay soil, something too rich is going to get a little bit too tall and floppy. And it will, like a lot of these other plants I've talked about, benefit from plant competition in the root zone. There's a verbena, blue vervine. That's another taller one. I'm throwing tall ones at you because as, as much as I espouse to, to gardeners, when we're thinking about garden design in front yards, about short plants and having, we want short plants in the front yard because people, they won't be scared by them. They won't be, it won't be overwhelming. But as much as I talk about short plants and having a, um, a landscape that's appealing to people driving by, I also know that we have inc some incredible options for taller plants that we can be put in the back of the border or in the backyard even. Uh, Verbena has thought is one of them. Works well in combination with the tall coreopsis, um, culver's root, um, so medium to moist soils. Um, you really probably do want a clump of this because the flowers are very tiny and unassuming. I had to really zoom in here to to show you because these are very tiny flowers. So if you can get a, a, a clump of a couple plants, that'll do better for you. But don't worry, you're still gonna get plenty of pollinators on it. Lead plant, I just love the leaves on this one. I mean, the flowers are good too, but I, I love these silvery soft sort of, sort of texture, especially among grasses and such. This is the plant that uh, when pioneers were plowing up on the player, Prairie. This is the one they always say was making the unzipping sound when that plow was going through, but I'm sure it was all the plants that were making that terrible um, unzipping sound as, as their roots were broken. Let's talk about bunnies. Wait a second, Benjamin, that's not a bunny. You're right. I don't have a picture of a bunny. I do have a picture of a prairie dog. I love prairie dogs. This is a black-tailed prairie dog. They are a keystone species in the Great Plains in the West. Um, 100, 200 other species rely upon them for their existence or in some way um, rely on them in, in some aspect, maybe not necessarily for their total existence, but they will use um, uh, prairie dog towns or benefit from prairie dogs in some um, important way. Prairie dogs are notorious for keeping the foliage clipped down around their holes so that they can see further out into the distance and see predators coming, which made me think of bunnies. So that's a roundabout way of saying Let's just pretend it's a bunny. So while herbivore pressure can vary based on a host of environmental and population conditions, the following selection of herbaceous perennials generally are gonna show resistance to herbivory. Now to reduce browsing of any treasure plants you have, maybe you know, grandma's whatever it is and you don't want it to be eaten, try surrounding them with plants deer and rabbits don't enjoy. So think like plant bodyguards, right? So this is where Allium cernuum comes in. I think it's gonna be my plant of the day for this presentation. It has so many multiple uses. So plants whose leaves are aromatic, even when crushed, um, leaves that are fuzzy, prickly, or leathery, tend not to be browsed. So here's the list that I would start with. We've already looked at some of these. Sedges in general are gonna be fine. Warm season grasses are in general going to be fine. Obviously, you should, I'm sure you know, if you're watching this, asters are gonna be eaten a lot. I've even been, been surprised to see rabbits eating milkweed at times. Uh, they must've been really desperate that year, or just really gone crazy that year because milkweed is toxic, especially in um, significant amounts. And the bunny I saw ate a significant amount of a milkweed. I think it was Asclepias incarnata, red milkweed slash swamp milkweed. So a lot of these plants are sun, some of them are shade. Once again, you got to do the research, it'll make you stronger. It's like eating your vegetables. Eryngium eucophilium, missing a C in the scientific name, I'm sorry about that. Dry to medium moist soils and fold to part sun. Even after it's done blooming, and it's about done here, it, it looks fantastic um, for the rest of the summer through at least half of the fall, if not the entire fall. There's your allium, going to be about 12 to 18 inches tall. And I love to just see drifts of, you know, 12, 15, 20, 30 going through uh, a planting of warm season grasses or sedge uh, because, well, it's just beautiful. That's why. 
And you have bumblebees hanging upside down from the flowers, which is always fun to watch. Goldenrod species are generally going to be resistant. Showy goldenrod is this one right here. Now, when I say generally resistant, I'm using these qualifying words for a very specific reason, because we cannot accurately predict what pressures um, populations of herbivores like rabbits and deer are gonna be going through year by year. They might have a population explosion and there's just so many of them, they're gonna eat everything and anything they can get their hands onto because resources are limited. Um, there might be a disease year, it might be a bad winter and, and their forage is gonna change a little bit. They're gonna be more desperate. So there's all these different um, population and, and climatic variables that we just can't predict. So I'm not gonna say these plants are perfect, but they are generally better. Blue sage, absolutely, because it has very ar um, aromatic foliage. It smells good. Sagey, what do you know? Bright blue flowers too. That's pretty close to accurate color if your monitor is, is even halfway decent. Pycnathemums, obviously fragrant. I think Virginia mountain mint is a little bit more fragrant than slender mountain mint. Um, I don't plant muticum out here in the central United States because number one, it's native. And so, and in, I mean, it's not native in the central, yes, but even if you do plant it, man, it spreads like crazy. It probably spreads like crazy in the east too. Don't plant it. All right, let's look at the five fundamentals of natural garden design. This is sort of a crash course. If you haven't looked at any of the other classes, um, this is gonna give you a quick overview of what natural, des natural garden design means and how to do it. So I've already talked about this a little bit, selecting plants that are behaved in relatively short under three feet. Um, this necessarily isn't a fundamental of natural garden design, but I think it is fundamental um, if you're re replanting a big chunk of your front yard in, in suburbia or urban areas. Because again, you wanna have shorter plants that, that are a little bit more unassuming and, and um, the people can see over and uh, people, people don't like tall plants, it's, it's sad. So you're gonna be doing your research, right? Plants can, can spread and grow differently based on soil type. This is another thing for today. And that's one reason why gardening by ecoregion versus hardiness zone is such a good idea. And you wanna look at the course starting your native plant garden for that one. Basically we have, how is it like 900 different ecoregions if you go down to the, to the most, most specific map. Um, whereas USD hardiness zone, you know, zone five out in Virginia and zone five in Colorado, it's totally different plant palette, totally different climate. So even if you're using a plant that's native to both areas, it's gonna grow very differently. And you just, you gotta be looking at ecoregion when you're doing these native landscapes. So another fundamental, planting in drifts and masses. This is definitely universal, no matter the height or, or spread of your plants. Generally, the larger the bed, the larger the masses and drifts. So, and if you can do that in layer, and it'd be nice if you can do that in layers. So you have ground layer, and then you have, that's maybe a foot or below, a mid high, three feet high, and then architectural plants, which are gonna be your least amount of plants. They'll be getting three, four, five, six feet tall, or you can be even using small shrubs or, trib, uh, or small trees is in, in that architectural layer. Oh, there's something else I wanted to say here about drifts and masses. Yes, the number. So if you have like a hundred square foot bed and you're putting in our new favorite plant, Allium cernuum and nodding onion, and a hundred square foot bed, you might only want a drift of 12 to 15, right? If you have a 5,000 square foot bed, you're probably gonna be putting in multiple drifts of 20 to 30 of these alliums, and they will, they will slowly self sow and the bulbs will slowly reproduce over time, but it's gonna be a while, especially if you're in clay soil. Oh, the things you get to learn today, right? Limit concurrent blooms. There's caveat here, but let's talk about it. In a smaller garden under a thousand square feet, having no more than three plants in bloom at any one time is probably gonna show a little bit more control and less visual cacophony to people going by. So that what that means is people will be less likely to think your landscape is weedy and messy. Now this is especially true when using large drifts or lots of massed repetition. And you do want repetition. The larger your garden is, the more repetition you wanna have because that's pleasing to us aesthetically. And obviously when you're using larger masses, you're also attracting more pollinators. They can more easily see it when they're flying overhead 10, 20, 50, 100 feet up in the air. So that's why don't just plant one 
purple dome aster plant three or five together or do three here three there two over here three over there you know depending on the size of your landscape but we want that repetition think about when you go out to a prairie or a meadow or a grassland you don't just see one of everything right you see drifts of this here drifts of that over there masses of this there masses there over there and, and repeated over and over and it, it's it's a very calming effect so we're trying to translate that into our natural gardens a little bit. Employ a monochromatic base layer. What that means is you're having a pretty consistent one green color um, underlying all of your planting. So that's, that's what we call a green mulch or matrix. It not only replaces annual wood mulch applications while fighting weeds and conserving soil moisture, it helps tie the landscape together and make it more legible. You know, just think about how lawns do that when you're driving through a neighborhood having that green carpet everywhere it, it, it ties everybody together it's this great democratizer right but it's also aesthetically pleasing it's it's a very calming effect same thing when you go out to a prairie we have that nice green ocean punctuated by beautiful flowering plants and it almost gives the flowers more definition more oomph and more power all right finally the fundamentals of natural design number five plan for winter interest don't cut your stuff down. Don't, don't, don't cut your, your garden down in fall. Many of our native grasses and perennials carry a lot of structural and textural interest well in the winter, if not into next year. So using the same principles as number two above, you can almost hit two birds with one stone here. Of course, every site requires nuance with these points. And they're, certain, they're not gonna be hard and fast rules for every site. They're just more like core guidelines that you're gonna need to tweak um, to, to the site conditions and whatever your core aesthetic is. So when we use native plant communities, we are going to be increasing ecological function, especially wildlife habitat. So use as many, as many native plants as you possibly can. That is your crash course, crash course and fundamentals of natural um, garden design. Um, hopefully that will help you a little bit as we're thinking about all the different things today in our wonderful smorgasbord. You know, that makes me think, do people even know what the word smorgasbord means? <laughs> we don't really use it anymore. I remember when I was a kid, I was like, oh yeah, we're going to function X and they're gonna have a smorgasbord or we're going out to whatever restaurant and they're gonna have a smorgasbord. Ugh. Maybe it's just because I grew up in Minnesota. Oh, look, it's another bonus section. Aren't you lucky? Let's play. By the way, the caterpillars at the Lincoln Children's Zoo. I know there's a couple of them out there. You used to know the firm who put who made them and I really wanted one, but then I heard they were like five or $10,000. So, nope. <laughs> All right, let's look in this bonus section at two different gardens. Something a lot of people have been asking me lately is, okay, great. You know, I'm not really good with the aesthetics. I wanna have native plants. I want it to look like the gardens you're designing. How do I do that? How can you make it easy for me? Well, it's, it's, it's actually not easy to make it easy for you because I don't know your site and there's so many, so many little microclimates going on. That being said, I'm familiar with natural plant communities and, and the habit of plants, um, regardless of whether they're growing in clay, growing in clay or, 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 or less soil or wet or moist soil, because they're always gonna perform differently, right? Depending on the soil conditions. But I'm familiar with the plants, I'm familiar with the community. So I can say, okay, you have a dry to medium shade garden. Let's put a matrix down of Carex albicans or Carex rosea Maybe planting those every 12 inches. And we're gonna assume we're gonna assume it's like a hundred square foot bet, right? So in that, so, you, so that means you probably have 80 to hundred, something like that sedge in there. And then you're gonna come in, you're gonna put some early meadow rue in, um, three to five plants. So you might wanna do, actually put those all together because you, you're, you're gonna wanna show it off a little bit more. If you put them too far apart, you can't really get the effect of them. So three to five phalloctrum, early meadow rue, meadow root together. Um, wild columbine, seven to 11, maybe you want even more. They don't really last that long. And, and you know, that red is very showy. Just do a drift of 15 through your landscape. Just a nice weaving drift. Put a couple geranium out there, one here, one over there, one down here. Um, they're gonna spread a little bit on you. Polygonatum by Florum. Maybe you just need one or a clump of three. Really, really depends on, on, on the, the bed itself, what the, what the best aesthetic is gonna be. And maybe put a couple of trichum cordifoliums in there. Um, oh my gosh, what's the common name? Can't remember. Anyway, it's a blue woodland aster. So 
Maybe you do one here, one there, one here, or you just do a clump of three. Again, it really it really depends on, on you know if this, what structure this garden bed is around or if it's out in the open. So um, you can certainly use more uh, of these if you want to. But this these are all going to grow really well together for lots of reasons: texture, um, roots, planting behavior, habit, all that good stuff. Now you got to dry to medium sun site. Let's have our matrix be Cytolus grama or prairie drop seed. Once again, you're looking at about every 12 inches centering those on there. So 80 to 100 plants, something like that in a 100 square foot bed. And this will be the massing and drifting. So put three Baptisium miners together, put three Asclepius tuberosus together. You can scatter those if you want to around, but it'd be better as one large clump. Echinacea pallida, I would do like a drift of those, uh, five, maybe even seven or eight, just a nice little drift somewhere in the bed. I'm going to drift the allium, Cernchenuum, the nodding onion. Uh, you might want to go on the higher end of that. Thatris aspera, I'd do that as one group as well. Those are going to get three to four feet tall. So you could probably a group of three. Um, if metal voles leave your latris corms alone in the fall, after a couple of years, you're going to have something like five to seven stalks of flowers coming up. So consider that when you're thinking about how many plants you want. Another way I look at how many plants I want is, well, let's plant a couple of extra because we're probably going to lose some. It just happens. It's nature. It's natural selection. So why not plant a little bit more? If you're using plugs, it's very economical. And then one symphio trichome oblongifolium, that's the aromatic aster. That thing gets about three feet wide after five years. So give it plenty of room. But you want it because it's got these beautiful flowers that are going into October, sometimes even November in a good year. So late season pollinators are gonna be very thankful to you. All right, let's talk about dandelion alternatives. What do I mean by dandelion alternatives? Well, let's see if I, if I can try and not, not cause too much trouble. I hear a lot every spring that dandelions are the first flower and we've got to leave them because pollinators need them. Nope, 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 nope. Um, dandelions are not the first flower and pollinators do not need, do not need them. But yeah, let's leave them. Let's not be spraying chemicals all over the place, right? We don't need to do that. Dandelions are also good at opening up clay soil, but they got some negatives. I think that would be the second slide. So dandelions only provide marginal pollinator nutrition. For example, a native plant like Pussy Willow Salix Discolor has a 14% protein content in its pollen, whereas dandelion only has 14%. So it's a big difference. Pollinators are gonna be wanting to use and will be a lot healthier if they use something like pussy willow, which is gonna be blooming during the same time as dandelion window is. We also do have native dandelions, like I'm not gonna pronounce the scientific name, but it's called prairie dandelion. Not very, not well cultivated though, however, but it's out there. So the interesting thing about uh, the, uh, the dandelion that we most commonly see everywhere is that its leaves and roots are alleliopathic, meaning they inhibit growth from nearby plants. One study even suggests that the pollen has the same property. So when a pollinator dumps dandelion pollen on another plant, like a native plant, the pollen actually inhibits seed production. So yeah, we probably do want less, we probably do want less dandelions around, but if the alternative is that we're spraying chemicals over the place, we probably shouldn't be doing that to get rid of them. Better to outcompete them with thick, lush native plant gardens. So you're going to love these couple of slides because they give us alternatives to dandelions. And what I mean by alternatives is plants that are going to be more beneficial for pollinators. And we're talking nectar and especially pollen. And these are all native plants. They're going to be blooming before, during, and right after the dandelion bloom window. So here's a list of woody species, trees and shrubs. You can just go down there, do your research, see if it's native to you, see if it works for your site conditions. Love my service, Barry. Um, viburnums are having a problem right now with the, with, with the beetle moving further west across the country. We'll see how long they last. Choke cherries, I love elderberries, taste great. I think you have to add sugar, don't you? I can't remember. And then we have lots of prairie savanna perennials and biennials. Let me see here what's biennial on this list. Blah, 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 blah. There's one too. Okay. Uh, so prairie smoke, I showed you that picture way up here at the beginning. I'm going to go back up and show it to you again. It's more a native, a uh, northern plains native. 
that there are, um, this is post blooming, the seed heads are developing. Very showy, of course. So it's a ground cover. The foliage pretty much stays right on the ground and the flowers are gonna be about 12 inches tall. Right there on the right is Zizia aurea, Golden Alexanders, incredibly beneficial. You know, the thing about these, these, the, the, these dandelion alternatives is that they're also working as host plants. And a lot of them, like Zizia aurea here, um, have a specialist relationship with certain bee species who depend on them for pollen. So these bee species are timing their life cycles for when these plants are flowering because they rely on that specific pollen um, to, to feed their larva back wherever their nests are. Because these bees only have the two to four week window to do their thing, right? Mate, reproduce, and die. Woodland perennials and ephem ephemerals. Here's a starter list for you. We've already talked about some of these. Once again, I love, I'm so excited that we have overlap on these lists. Uh, yeah, that's geranium there on the right. There is your thallic trim early meadow rue on the right again. I just love it. We had to do another picture of it. Some more woodland perennials and ephemerals. All right, this will be our last topic and probably well, maybe as controversial as dandelions, I don't know. Um, less honeybee, more native bee. What do I mean by that? Let's go. You probably know what I mean. I have a friend who said this, keeping honeybees to help pollinators is like keeping chickens to help grassland birds. We have, we have a media, I don't know, we have a national conversation where we, we first heard about the troubles that honeybees were having. Well, honeybees are globally stable. Their numbers are going to be fine. They have high colony numbers actually. Um, but they're really just an agricultural issue. They're not a conservation issue because we've brought them in, we move them around the country, we stress them out, we're actually harming the honeybees. Um, keeping honeybees does not help native bees. We have almost 4,000 species of native bees. If you wanna help native bees, you need to be planting native flowers and having large diverse gardens wherever you possibly can. Now, another detriment that honeybees have on native bees is they have large colony size and they have a large forage range which means they're gonna be spreading disease a lot more easily. So they'll go forage on a flower, leave some nasty something there, and a bumblebee or a sweat bee or somebody will come along and, and pick up that disease and that's the end of it. So we got mason bees. These are just some of our native bees. We got mason bees there on the left. Um, oh my goodness, that's a small carpenter bee. I can't remember exactly the name there on the right, but if you leave your stems up 12 to 18 inches in the spring cut down, you'll have these small carpenter bees, hundreds, thousands of them coming in and out of all the stems in your garden. And that's a Melisodes there, a specialist on sunflower uh, family plants right there, sneezeweed. You can see all that pollen she's got. It's just amazing and beautiful. Fuzzy and cute, aren't they? So less honeybee, more native bee. Let's be more concerned about native bees because they do by far the bulk of the pollination. They're better pollinators, they're more effective pollinators. They give us better fruit set because we have so many diverse species working the blooms at the same time. And you know, honeybees, just, just one species. If you want a really good strawberry, you wanna have as many native bees pollinating that thing as possible because there's all these little flowers on it. So this is from the Xerxes Society. It's a, uh, you can hopefully just type it into your, your browser. It's a solid summary of all the issues that focuses on, on working with beekeepers for the best apiary placement. Because one of the issues is that um, if, we're, if we're placing these honeybee colonies too close to wild bee habitats like prairies or meadows or something like that, they're gonna be out competing the native bees, stealing, stealing forage resources like pollen and leaving the native bees just you know out of luck. Not to mention that disease issue we just talked about. Here's a study that focuses on Southern California. And as you may or may not know, California is one of the richest states in native plant diversity. And of course it's a bee mecca. The entire Southwest has incredible bee diversity. So for this study, you gotta keep in mind that many native bees have evolved to use specific native plants for pollen to feed their young. That's, that's our specialist bee that we we're talking about before. They say new research from the same team found that honeybees focus their foraging on the most abundantly flowering native plant species, where they often account for more than 90% of pollinators observed visiting flowers. So again, that's that competition problem, the stealing of resources 
from our native bees who are really driving our native plant population because without the native bees, many of whom have specialist relationship with these native flowers, we have less native flowers, we have less habitat, we have less plant structure, we have less ecosystem services going on. We just start to have a collapsing um, uh, ecoregion and, and native plant environment, which we obviously don't want. Here's another, here's another link. Um, it's a Huffington Post article, but it's linking to scientific articles. So one of the most important studies of uh, native bees looked at 41 farms on six continents. They grew almonds, blueberries, buckwheat, cherries, coffin, blah, 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 blah. The results blew up the conventional wisdom. Wild insects increased fruiting in every single farm where they were present. But honeybees only produced a significant increase in fruiting 14% of the time. There wasn't a single crop for which increased fruiting caused by honeybees outperformed that of wild bees. On average, wild bees delivered twice the bump of honeybees. So yeah, let's get more hedgerows, even in our, an urban environment. Hedgerows are wonderful native bee habitat. Remember that 25% of our native bees will be nesting in cavities and in, in wood or stone or something like that, but the majority, almost 75%, are going to be nesting in open ground. So have open soil patches in your landscape, especially if it's loose soil, um, sand, loam, lust soils, going to be perfect for queen, for, for mama bees getting their, uh, getting their larva pushed, uh, push, put into the soil. And this even is the kind of habitat we need to be seen in our cities and urban areas, wherever we can get it. It doesn't matter that there are cars driving by and perhaps once in a while, we unfortunately lose an insect to a passing automobile's grill. We need this habitat everywhere and not just for pollinators. You can see the cutouts in the curb right here. This thing is bringing in water and cleaning it and filtering it before it overwhelms storm drains. So, hey, we gotta be doing this. It matters on so many levels. That is the end here. I hope you will consider joining Prairie Up. It's our online membership community where we're having, we have some very deep science-based conversations with lots of expert gardeners around the country. It'll really, it'll really kick, kick it up a notch, take it up a notch for you and your garden um, in the future, I promise you. As always, Yimby, yes in my backyard. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. It's been a little bit different than what I usually do. Uh, if you can find a smorgasbord near you, email me and let me know about it. Please don't email me and let me know about it. All right, thank you for joining me. I hope you have a good day. Prairie up.